started. Thank you very much, uh, Mian, for the recording. Uh, this is uh, our Delta Talks number 13, uh, and we are very pleased to discuss a very complicated topic, uh, which is about data sharing. Uh, but we do that in a very interesting way with the example uh, that our invited speakers for today from the Free University of Amsterdam uh, will share with us about um, a, a salinity map initiative in which there is also data sharing, which is a kind of essential part of it. Um, and they will uh, enlighten us on that. Uh, my name is Katharine Terwischa van Scheldinga. I'm from Wageningen University and Research. Uh, and the session is co-hosted together with Ola. Any opening sentence from your side, Ola? Just also welcome uh, back after uh, the summer break, maybe for many of, of you uh, to the Delta Talk series. Happy to be here again. Uh, and I'm particularly interested in this talk today about salad, uh, the saline database. I have to say I have to probably leave a little bit early today, so I may not be here at the end of the discussion. OK, uh, thank you very much. Uh, somehow Kate disappeared from my screen. Um, so I'm first handing over to you, Pim. Um, yep. uh, uh, I don't know exactly who will go first, but uh, we have a presentation. Uh, and uh, I understood there is also some interactive parts to the presentation. Um, and we will have some further reflection uh, after that, uh, uh, all the audience are, of course, invited to share their questions. Uh, please use the chat uh, and also uh, you will have opportunity later on to ask your question. Pim, the floor is yeah. yours. Uh, shall I share my screen? That's fine. OK, awesome. Um, all right. Well, welcome everyone to this Delta talk. Uh, I'd like to begin with asking you all a question as uh, this is the first Delta talk I'm attending and I'm not entirely sure what the audience is like and where you're all from. Uh, and that will make the interactive part with the map a bit more fun. So if you could please uh, enter in your chat who you are, where you're from and what you briefly work on in like one sentence, what topic you work on, what field you work on, that, that will make it a lot more fun. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to start a presentation uh, titled From a Case Study to a Large Database, Sharing Data to Map Saline Agriculture Initiatives. It's a mouthful, but we will uh, yeah, dissect it uh, step by step during this presentation. Um, all right. So the Vrije Universiteit of Amsterdam and the Institute of Environmental Studies that me and my colleague Kate Negac work for uh, do quite a lot with uh, qualitative research. We work uh, at the Department of Environmental Policy Analysis. So we work a lot with governance, environmental policy, uh, both on the food, water, ecosystems, and energy nexus and salinity, of course, uh, is a topic that falls within this nexus. Uh, so there are multiple projects for which we have uh, uh, yeah, executed the methodology that we will describe hereafter. So we got the Biostar um, um, project uh, in three phases, Biostar 1, 2 and 3. And that's uh, a project that we got from the PBL. So that's the Netherlands and Environmental Assessment Agency in English. Uh, we also have uh, the Salad project, where we already worked for, for quite some years. Uh, and this is a project that we do together with colleagues from Germany, Italy, but also Morocco and Egypt uh, and Belgium. Um, and then re more recently, we got a project from the Netherlands Enterprise Agency, the FAO, uh, where we try to look at the salinity initiatives beyond Europe and the Mediterranean. So there we went uh, more into Sub-Saharan Africa. All right, so some uh, I, oh, Kate is I back. I managed here. to reconnect, so sorry for that. It seems uh, indeed just as the Corona time. So if we can go a little bit uh, back to the previous slide, I can add also a little bit more about that. Again, yeah, sorry sure. for disappearing in exactly in the wrong moment, but it seems to be no uh, <laughs> uh, an interesting um, coincidence. So yeah. if we 
managed to get back to the previous slide, then I can uh, tell a little bit more. Because yeah. indeed, um, Tim has now just listed four different projects, um, which basically focus on mapping environmental governance landscapes. So what are the initiatives, what are state actors, private actors, and also um, social actors in different realms. So actually, we started with biodiversity and climate, so two projects that Tim has mentioned, and indeed, they went down with the Environmental Assessment Agency in the Netherlands and with DigiClima. And the whole process started more or less 10, 15 years ago when um, the UNCCC, so the Climate Convention, and also people working with climate started to wonder, okay, we have states coming together, but we also want to know what other actors are doing to contribute to, uh, well, to the common goal of climate change, um, well, adaptation and mitigation at that point of time. And then we took it to biodiversity because the Convention of Biological Diversity was also interested in, okay, what's going on there, um, to a few different fields because we moved through agriculture, fisheries, um, I think mining as well. So there were different areas through the years. And then we went to the Salinti initiatives because that was indeed the new field that was interesting. And we saw that there are also more and more actors coming there. And thus two projects, Salad and um, Salinti in Sub-Saharan Africa, were with me using the same methodology. Thanks a lot, Pim, if we can move one next. But yeah, the big question is why do we map it at all? So as I said, the need often comes from the external actors, some from uh, either conventions that want to know what other actors are doing, or also from Dutch institutions, uh, Dutch governmental institutions, which are wondering, okay, who is actually there? Who are our stakeholders? Who are important actors? Um, and we also know that this uh, landscape is getting increasingly... Um, Oh, I think Kate is a bit stuck, or is it only on my no. side? No, no, I'm uh, hearing you well, uh, Catherine. Okay. Meanwhile, I'm seeing in the chat the different people uh, uh, kind of introducing themselves. So, Pim, you get a yeah. overview there. Yeah, I think I'm back. But good. yes, what do you prefer, Pim? If you want to continue, maybe that's safer. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, all right, I'll share my screen again. I was just uh, going through a list of uh, people. So I see we have some people from Sri Lanka uh, and we have someone from the International Rice Institute, which is interesting because that's one of the initiatives on the map. So that's uh, quite a cool coincidence. But yeah, let me go back to the presentation. So yeah, as Kate was saying, um, governance gets more and more complicated. Uh, Problems get more and more complicated and more and more actors come together to solve these problems. And those actors uh, vary in types and across skills as well. So uh, uh, in some projects uh, and initiatives, there are regional governance agencies. Uh, as an example, in the Netherlands, we got the water authorities that are in between uh, municipalities and provinces. And they sometimes work together in initiatives with national governance, but also with local initiatives, the private sector, uh, civil society. And all these different actors have different agendas uh different uh, benefits that they receive from these projects so moving towards shared interest uh, and public benefits becomes more and more complicated all right so uh, as a first step to analyze what is going on what the effectiveness of this governance is uh it's quite important that you map what is happening and by whom is that happening um so in order to answer that question uh, we first, of course, in science, need to go to a common understanding of a concept. Uh, so we defined an initiative uh, and thereupon based the inclusion criteria according to the uh, following uh, four uh, uh, criteria. And that's uh, from a paper by uh, Weidenberg, Patberg and uh, Christensen from 2016. Um, and these are the criteria that we have used for all different projects to include all different initiatives. So that's for the biodiversity project, for the salinity project, et cetera, et cetera. So um, the initiatives need to be governed by international, transnational, and national institutions from multiple uh, geographic areas or countries, uh, which not only have the intentionality to steer policy, uh, but also explicitly mention a, cover, a common governance goal. Uh, accomplishable by significance governance functions. Still sounds a bit woozy and a bit abstract, but um, I'll dissect it a bit more later on. 
so what we did is we first uh, went through the internet uh, and mapped a, a first round of initiatives. Uh, and after that, we contacted all the uh, some of the different initiatives uh, and we basically started to do a snowball procedure from there. So we asked them like, hey, what else do you know? Then we contacted them. And then after a while, we had uh, some uh, uh, yeah data saturation, so we couldn't really get uh, any further. So we uh, kind of knew that we reached uh, reached the data saturation point. After that, we of course had to check the validity of these initiatives. Uh, so we conducted a semi-automated keyword analysis, and these keywords uh, were validated by experts. Uh, and then some definitely had a clear match to relevance uh, from the initiatives and some still needed to be further validated. So then we did some uh, in-depth interviews with experts to go through these uh, different initiatives to ask for validation. Well, so after those three steps, we went from 150 initiatives and then 51 dropped out because they were deemed uh, not significant enough in the field of saline agriculture or they did not meet uh, reach the inclusion criteria as described previously. So we ended up with 99 initiatives. All right, after that, uh, we had to gather the data. So uh, these were basically qualitative variables uh, that stated the governance goals, the governance functions that are previously mentioned. So the four governance functions are operational, financing, information, networking, and standards and commitments that you can see in the top right. So operational governance functions are a bit more, uh, yeah, uh, actionable on the ground. So those could be pilot plots in which they uh, try certain crops and crop varieties. Uh, it could be fields in which they uh, replant trees to increase biodiversity. Well, financing uh, governance functions uh, look more at financial institutions uh, and creating agents through financing certain communities and projects. Information networking uh, focus a bit more on knowledge uh, dissemination. And standards and commitments is, is setting standards uh, upon which certain initiatives and actors can uh, uh, hold. Um, and we furthermore looked at uh, the number of actors that were active in these uh, initiatives, the type of actors, so whether they were from the public, private uh, sector or from civil society. We also extracted a lot of geographical data, so where do they uh, conduct their work, uh, from which countries are the different actors, um, et cetera, et cetera. We also looked at the launch year of the initiative and for how long it lasted or for how long it lasts. And sometimes that's indefinite and we also map that. We looked at the thematic focus. So it did function uh, focus on halophytes. So those are salt loving plants, uh, more conventional crops, water management, soil management, uh, and, and lots more. And we also looked at MRV schemes, so measurement, reporting, and verification. So do they actually report what they do? Do they uh, report their impact? Is this, uh, uh, does this have accountability mechanisms? Can we check what they're doing? And there we can also uh, yeah, do more research on effectiveness following those MRV uh, mechanisms. All right, uh, so the methodological challenges. Kate, uh, if you're online, do you briefly want to touch upon this? Yes, sure. It seems I'm uh, jumping in and out, but thanks a lot. Uh, good. So with methodological challenges, it's actually, um, again, quite uh, a few little things that pop up while we conduct that research process. One's the initiative selection. So sometimes um, it's a little bit difficult to decide whether the initiative actually is an initiative. So what selection criteria do we apply? Pim has already mentioned uh, the criteria that we use consistently through all the data sets to, to be able to distinguish initiatives. But still, sometimes that becomes a problem, um, especially um, if the initiative also uh, disappears or there's not enough data about it. Same comes um, with the variables operationalization. So this is, um, again, a number of different variables that Pim mentions, for example, actors, um, functions. These are actually relatively straightforward, but if we go to the themes, if we go to the SDGs or some other uh, variables which may be interesting to know, we need to decide how we operationalize them. And of course, for that, we need certain assumptions. And since we want to keep the database usable, uh, we also need to choose certain categories. So here we need to decide how f how fine grain data do we actually collect and also what are the categories that we choose or maybe perhaps if we want text but if we keep text then of course um this data becomes much harder to analyze so there are always pluses and minuses of those choices as well 
Um, to give you an example, for some data sets, we have around 50 variables. For some others, we have around 100. So it's also a, it's also a big impact of the small decisions that we make at the beginning. Uh, the next challenge is actually keeping the data set up to date and uh, different ways to do it. Usually we update them every two years because the process takes around half a year and um, it's a mix, as Pim said, of semi-automated keyword analysis and expert workshops. So in that way, we also try to keep the data up to date. Sometimes we have hackathon days so that we can do it quickly and efficiently, but usually it requires, um, well, basically some time to update the data set. And finally, presentation and valorization. So during this presentation, you will also see an example, uh, Saline AgriMap done together uh, in a partnership with the Netherlands Food Partnership and Netherlands Water Partnership, where we can see the initiatives being displayed and accessible to other partners. But for other uh, thematic areas, for example, biodiversity and climate, uh, the initiatives have not been uh, accessible in this presentable way, but you just get a database, which is either online search engine or an Excel file. And in that way, it's of course much harder to valorize on it. Okay, we can go further. Yeah, um, so I briefly described all the, uh, some of the variables that we uh, use, for instance, uh, for the salad project uh, for mapping the initiatives. Uh, so one of them was the number of governing uh, members. So you can see in the, in the picture on the left, uh, that most of the initiatives had a relatively small number of governing members, so one to five, but there were also quite some that had uh, around 20 or even more than 25. And this shows that some of these initiatives are quite complex in nature. Uh, and it's also quite complex to actually see what they're doing because there are so many different stakeholders and they all have different uh, needs and desires. Uh, so yeah, moving, moving the needle uh, by a bit also becomes more complicated there. On the right, we've got this uh, thing called uh, a governance triangle. Uh, and there you can kind of see uh, what the makeup of the initiatives was in terms of uh, stakeholder types. Uh, so the little triangle on the top represents uh, the percentage of initiatives that only had public actors as governing members. Uh, and then uh, the triangle on the top, uh, sorry, on the bottom right uh, shows the percentage of initiatives that only had private uh, actors as members, bottom left, only civil society members. So that's a very uh, small number. And then the four different areas in the middle are the, yeah, uh, the combination of different um, um, stakeholder types. So the triangle in the middle, 15.2% uh, of the initiatives had members from all three different stakeholder types. Uh, and you can see that the, the upper three uh, areas that are uh, marked in dark blue uh, those are all uh, initiatives that had a public member or multiple multiple public stakeholder types in a form in their um, initiatives so we can conclude uh, by looking at this that the public sector uh, predominantly uh, dominates these initiatives they're very present they're in a lot of different uh, initiatives and the private sector has not really stepped in yet. Why? Well, one of these reasons could be that uh, a lot of these projects and the field of state and agriculture in a lot of different contexts is still in, in its niche. Uh, it's still arguable if in, if in all different contexts it is profitable. So the private sector is a bit hesitant to jump in until the business models are a bit more uh, further developed. So those are already some interesting findings and conclusions and discussions you can have based on just looking at the uh, actor makeup of these initiatives. All right, uh, we can also uh, we also mapped when these initiatives uh, got erected and we saw that there was a big jump in 2018, 2019, 2020. Uh, so initiatives of sale and agriculture are becoming more popular. Why is that? Well, there could also be different explanations for that. Uh, it has to do a bit with momentum. Like we can see that uh, th there is more interest in uh, sale and agriculture. And why? Well, you can see on the news that there are lots of droughts increasingly happening, for instance, in Southern Europe, Northern Africa, but also here in the Netherlands, we are having more and more drought than we always have been a country where we had too much water and our water governance is, is uh, as for a large part focused a lot on that how to manage too much water but now we also have to look at too little water and using brackish uh, or in some cases slightly saline water could be interesting in certain climate scenarios in the future so uh yeah certain uh, climatic developments 
uh, and also uh, uh, yeah, cert certain funding schemes uh, by the public sector and interest therein uh, has can explain some of these developments. Uh, all right, and governance functions, as I previously mentioned, uh, uh, there are four that we look at. Uh, operational uh, uh, governance functions was largely uh, dominant in our data sets, uh, and, and that's because a lot of these initiatives were focusing on, on pilot plots, on uh, doing research on the effect of salt on plants, on the effect of water management on plants, and that's quite hands-on. Um, so, as I said, uh, a lot of this research is still in early development, uh, and that makes sense that that then focuses on operational uh, uh, functions. And in later stages, uh, it, we could hypothesize that it could uh, move a bit more towards financing and uh, standards and commitment uh, functions. All right, and we focus, also focused on themes. So, what do the initiatives actually look at? And we found that uh, conventional crops uh, were often uh, studied in these initiatives. They often look at water management. Uh, they often looked at salinity adaptation, more so than salinity mitigation. Uh, and also, a lot of uh, about 20% of the initiatives look at soil management. Uh, same for halophytes. Then around 7% uh, looked at aquaculture. Right, and on the top right, you can see a picture of Salicornia. That's an example of a halophytic plant, so salt-loving plants. Uh, and some halophytes can even uh, resist up to uh, 50 decisiemen per meter. So that's some uh, types of seawater. Uh, those are that salt. So you could, in, in theory, some of these halophytic plants, you could uh, irrigate them or water them with uh, some uh, um, um, sources of seawater and they would still thrive and you could use them as a biofuel, you could use them as fodder, a fodder and you could even uh, use them as a garnish on uh, salads and dishes for humans and they're really nice, really tasty, very crunchy. Um, right, uh, we also looked at the SDGs uh, and 58% of the SDGs focused on uh, zero hunger or they were linked to zero hunger which makes sense because uh, saline agriculture is uh, uh, yeah, a bit of a topic that focuses on food security, uh, uh, um, also at uh, fresh water security, so that makes sense that SDG 6 uh, can often be linked to it. Decent work in economic growth because a lot of farmers' incomes uh, are dependent on agriculture, which are threatened by uh, fresh water security um, and soil. Uh, the state of the soils and salinity severely affects the soils. So by looking at saline agriculture, you can also maintain a sustained income. Uh, climate action, because as I said in, uh, in a previous slide, uh, salinity can be linked in uh, quite a lot of context to climate change. Um, and I also said in the beginning that we, the VU conducted a research on uh, on saline agriculture in sub-Saharan Africa. So we basically applied the same methodology as we did for the salad project in Europe and the Mediterranean, but we applied this to sub-Saharan Africa. And we look and we uh, saw, as you can see on the map on the left, that a lot of initiatives were found in Mozambique, in Kenya, in Senegal. Uh, and here as well, uh, as for the salad project, we found that most uh, projects focus on operational governance functions, but also a lot here on information and networking, uh, which was interesting. So that's uh, slightly more uh, prevalent here than uh, it was in Europe and the Mediterranean, but also for financing and standards and commitments, governance functions, it was still far behind, as it's also here still in quite an early stage of research. Tim, All right. I have a question uh, uh, in time-wise, yeah, because yeah, yeah. I understand you needed some time for interaction as well. Yeah. Um, how many more slides are coming? Uh, I think just two or three, but I can... Um, so okay, this, no, that's fine. Please this, proceed. Yeah. This, but I also like to keep a lot of time for a Q and A. Q &A. So uh, okay. there is a report on on all of the work that we did in uh, Europe and the Mediterranean, and also in Sub-Saharan Africa. So maybe uh, we can share those to the attendees afterwards, and all the uh, conclusions of both research can also be found there. Uh, so I'll skip the ones for South uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, and I focus a bit more on the overall key findings and emerging questions. Um, so, as I said, most of the initiatives had a hybrid uh, setup of uh, uh, stakeholder types, but the public sector and research actors uh, were um, predominantly active. Uh, operational and information sharing activities were the main governance functions. 
conventional crops and water management uh, was were the themes that was mostly looked at. Uh, there were quite strong verification schemes, but very few initiatives actually linked quantitative goals and annual reporting to this. So in practice, it was quite vague what they reported on and what they did. So to actually measure effectiveness in quantitative ways is and will be very difficult with this database of initiatives. Um, so that could be improved if we want to improve effective governance in the future. Um, all right. And as I said, there are st uh, strong links to FDG uh, 2, so Zero Hunger and SDG 6, uh, Clean Water and Sanitation for All, and 13, Climate Action, both for uh, uh, North Africa and uh, Europe and the Mediterranean, um, and SDG 17, Partnerships. Uh, they were also very uh, predominantly found in Sub-Saharan Africa, so that's a bit of a difference. Uh, and this has all of this has or could have consequences for upscaling potential, right? So if you want to upscale this, if you want to include uh, and, and mobilize the financial uh, sector, then quantitative data, reporting, verification schemes are important to, to uh, make the next steps, right? And also to include the private sector more in these initiatives will get the ball rolling um, for upscaling. But as it's still quite niche, uh, quite in, in, in a pilot phase, uh, as it's predominantly uh, operationalized by the public sector, there are still a lot of steps that need to be taken for this really to scale up. Uh, so we're doing a lot of work on how this scaling up could happen, should happen, what steps need to be taken across all different stakeholder types. Uh, and yeah, that would be a whole nother presentation to talk about that. So uh, let's keep the conversation going after this presentation, I'd say. Um, but for now, I've done enough talking. Uh, now to the fun part where this presentation actually uh, is about and, and should be about, right? So we've we've done all this research and uh, yeah, to most people in the world, it's quite abstract. The variables are abstract. What we're doing is quite abstract. It's not very tangible. Uh, it's not very accessible to farmers, uh, to to maybe even to a lot of members of the private sector. So the yeah, how this product happened was quite a natural process. So it's in collaboration with the Netherlands Food Partnership and the Netherlands Water Partnership, uh, and with us, the Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam. So we. I basically talked about the research we were doing and uh, yeah, also that's quite geographically linked everything we're doing. So then we just like brainstormed about the idea of making it into an interactive map uh, that kind of gets rid of all the uh, all the buzzwords, all the all the academic jargon and makes it a bit more interactive and fun and, and intuitive. Uh, so then we yeah set that project up and, and made it happen. Uh, well, easier said than done. It's it's quite complicated to actually make data into uh, a, a tangible interactive map with a semi good uh, UI. Uh, so it was a long project, but we uh, yeah we made something out of it now. So uh, I hope you all like it. So you can all uh, take your laptop and go to www.salinagrimap.com. You can also use it on your phone. It works a bit better on your laptop, I gotta say, but it does work on both devices. I also have a QR code, and you can scan that with your phone. And then it also brings you to the website. So for the next uh, five minutes, I'd like to invite you to just try out the website. Uh, just click on the map, uh, look at uh, areas of the world that interest you, uh, look at uh, some projects that interest you, but also look at uh, how the data is visualized, about how everything I've just said is put into a map and, and see how that feels. Um, does it give you information that you understand that is interesting, that um, inspires you? And uh, yeah, just have a look around. There's also a knowledge portal if you go to the menu, and there we've also uh, gathered a lot of uh, um, e-learning courses, instruction videos, uh, a lot of uh, material about map uh, mapping of saline soils, uh, but instruction manuals for farmers. So also have a look there. And then uh, for the next five minutes, I'll stop talking. And uh, yeah, let's get back in five.
All right, I see we're a bit uh, tight on time, so uh, I'd invite you that after these Delta talks, you, uh, if you want, you can spend a lot more time uh, looking at the Salon Agro map, and you can always email us if you have any questions or ideas. But for now, I'd like to open the floor to you all and uh, discuss what we've seen, um, how the presentation is translated into the map, and what you think of it. So who wants to start? Maybe a first question, do you, do you find the map useful at all? Oh, I feel like I'm teaching a university again. Everyone's so shy. All right. So, uh, QVU, what do you think of it? See, your microphone is on. All right. Then I'll move to the next one. Uh, Mary Ann Batas, what do you think of it? Uh, well, I, I'm. Exploring the map now, and um, I, I find um, it interesting to see the different initiatives in different countries. So I think this will be useful for those who are doing, you know, similar research initiatives or even development initiatives to connect with with people and, you know, build their network. All right. So um, may I ask you, uh, where do you work and what kind of work do you do? Um, I'm. Um, uh, at the at the moment, the research manager of um, the AMD initiative and also um, the senior associate scientist on environmental science at ERI. So, okay. And do you work with salinity at all? Um, I was involved in 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 our projects uh, in in one of our projects in Bangladesh that um, ended last year and and continues under the Asian Mega Delta. So it. Yeah, it deals with um, monitoring the salinity level of um, the, the polders in the coastal zone of Bangladesh. And maybe I can invite um, our um, key uh, local um, coordinator there, Dr. Manaranjan Mandal, who is also doing, um, who's more immersed on, on this work. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you. Um, and do you think if you would uh, start working on a project on Salenti in Bangladesh, could this map uh, function a role into explore what's happening there um, as like a first step, or would you look somewhere else? Um, I have to check because there are projects. I actually looked at Bangladesh, and um, there are projects there that it that's my first time to learn about it, so that that's interesting for me. So I think that's. Yeah, it, it's a good um, kind of um, starting point for really looking at the who else are working in that um, program. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. And yeah, thanks um, also as for last this, question. this presentation. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for uh, interacting. Um, and um, maybe a last question. So how do you think uh, everything I talked about in the presentation, how did that then translate to the map? Was it was it was it translated and was it visualized in a way that you expected, or was it very different? Um, it's uh, actually the 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 key um, the information that you shared reflected on the information up, uh, on the program on the individual initiatives. Um, so uh, it took me a while to understand, you know, the, the categories. Um, but um, yeah, I think it. It helps to have an overview of of um, the whole study and then look at the individual initiatives. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, I see there are also some questions in the chat, so I will quickly look at them. I maybe see, uh, Tim, you can. Maybe, sorry to interrupt. Maybe you can move to the hand because Ole has a hand up. Oh yeah, Ole. Yeah, just a quick question. I saw many uh, entries in Europe. Uh, yeah. Relatively few in Asia. I mean, a handful in the Mekong Delta, but uh, the rest of Asia are uh, very scarcely populated with entries. Why is that? Um, because you don't have the connections, or because how how do you get the entries? Yeah, 
So uh, thank you for the question. That's also something that we have been asking ourselves a lot uh, and uh, uh, yeah, people from the initiatives we've worked with. And there are a few explanations about this. So one of the criteria to include uh, initiatives into this database is that they have to have a public uh, accessible website. Uh, uh, and that has to do with transparency as well. We don't want to be the one that controls all the data and then uh, basically say like, hey, we know this is happening, so take our word for it. Uh, and we present it. We also want to be able to link it to a public domain uh, where they uh, talk about the uh, the initiatives. We don't want to have that control of all the data in our hands. Uh, so it could, one of the explanations could be um, that uh, in Asia there are less initiatives that have public websites. Uh, for EU initiatives that are funded by the EU, it's usually a, a, a requirement that there is a website and there is a public data on it. So maybe in the nature of the funding structures, uh, it can be linked to it. Another one is that, uh, as I said, uh, the inclusion criteria had that it had to be multiple countries. Uh, so an, an international uh, initiative. Uh, and it could be that in Asia there are more national initiatives. Uh, we we have done some mapping on national initiatives, but we haven't translated it yet into the uh, say an AgriMap database, uh, mainly due to time constraints and uh, and resources. Another one could be a language barrier. Like we've mainly looked in English and also in some other languages, but maybe in Asia there are a lot of public websites in uh, local languages that don't have an English page that we can get to. Um, so that is another big bottleneck that we could overcome by having local partners uh, uh, that look into it. But that's, uh, yeah, again, a bit of a, a problem in, in terms of uh, time and resource constraints. Um, yeah, Kate, did I miss uh, something? Do you have something to add? Just jumping very quickly, there's also um, another very pro prosaic reason, I would say. So um, the map is being populated based on the projects. And so far, uh, we have focused on a few regions to showcase the initiatives from these um, areas that were also linked to specific projects. So basically Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Europe, Mediterranean and Middle East, um, Southeast Asia, now Argentina and the region around there is being prepared. But hopefully um, within the next two years we will have the whole globe populated as well because uh, there is a new project called Sustain that aims to cover the whole map. So it's a little bit of work in progress as well. Yeah, right, thank you. Okay, uh, can I can I ask a question uh, linking to the the chat uh, pin because you just mentioned uh, that some of the uh, initiatives that are included are the international initiatives, uh, and my question in the chat was about the local initiatives. Can you say something on that? Yeah. Uh, so, Kate, maybe you can handle that question because, um, sure. like. <laughs> the the or origin of this process happened when I was still in high school, uh, <laughs> so I'm not sure why, like what the link is between the international uh, initiatives and the like more abstract level of governance that we look at in this context. Sure. So the methodology is basically fit for any type of initiatives, um, but um, at some point of time when mapping other governance landscapes, not necessarily this one related to salinity, we realized that there are two predictors of the initiatives being, let's say, more stable, thus being able to track them for a longer time. The first one was being transnational, so basically crossing a border, and then bigger countries, which we, we treated also as being um, trust state. So let's say in the US, uh, if the initiative is only based in the US and but crosses the state border, then we observe that these initiatives uh, they usually last a little bit longer. Um, so that is that is one reason. So to keep the databases stable and be able to observe them, we usually display only the international initiatives and we also track the national ones and the local ones. But um, yeah, we have let's say them in a separate in a separate tab in a separate filter, just to make sure that we can also see and observe uh, how is the move between the local and the international initiatives. And the second reason is the language. So um, again, uh, we mostly track initiatives that um, have information available in English. We actually also created an alternative database um, for uh, South America for biodiversity at some point of time to see and compare whether we see the same trends um, if we check them in Spanish, Portuguese and French. Um, so this is of course possible, but sometimes it's uh, 
also simply the, the language barrier. So we can do it for the main languages, but if we go into the websites that are um, written in the, um, well, in the languages that we don't speak, then we either need a, a good uh, AI tool or we need a researcher that is also able to track and understand that. So this is a little bit of a challenge and a barrier to tracking local initiatives that may be also in the local language. Uh, we actually did a tiny little uh, trial also in uh, Kenya where there are many local initiatives and local languages and very quickly, um, let's say automated translators um, are out of scope. So then you really need local people, local translators, um, and also long time commitment, because we want to keep this databases for years to be able also to see the impact. Um, it was not presented now, but for when, when we analyze the data, when we actually look into so what questions, we try to look at the um, impact, the theory of change, the effectiveness, and then we need a little bit of a time span. So if something disappears after a year or two, uh, of course, it's good to put it on a map, but it may be less useful for people, practitioners, because people are probably not there, and also less useful for research because you can't really tell much about uh, potential change. I'm okay. not sure if that answers the question, maybe. Uh, uh, it's definitely an answer, but it's it's. Uh, I I still think that uh, um, uh, you might miss out on important information. But that that I understand the, the reasons why you did it. Uh, let's move to the question of uh, Arifun Nahar. Arifun Nahar, would you like to come in? Yes, thank you. This is Arifun Nahar, Bangladesh. soil research that. Uh, I have visited the website and I saw that you have conducted a project in um, screening out abiotic stress tolerance genetic varieties. That is very good. Um, as well as uh, we need to give emphasis on soil management for saliency control at formal label. And uh, I have mentioned, I should mention another point that data collection and analysis is a problem. Uh, analysis method and uh, extracting different parameter or mapping uh, salinity. This is very difficult. You have mentioned, I think so. And we should uh, follow a harmonized methodology. Now, another point, uh, you, you are conducting a project in Africa that is the sensor-based salinity forecasting system. That is, uh, I think, maybe very useful in a formal level, and uh, it was help, helpful in Bangladesh and uh, 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 very helpful for a uh, farmer uh, in formal level. And uh, finally, thank you. I have met uh, with one of our two, uh, two speaker in last year at Uzbekistan. Uh, I think. Um, Catherine and uh, Bibhan Husopin. Uh, I, I was at a seminar in Uzbekistan. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, for sharing your experiences with us. Uh, I sometimes missed a bit uh, because the connection was not fully covering all your words. But uh, one of your uh, questions is related to the Asia Mega Deltas activities in Bangladesh. I'm asking Monoranjan because he's on the call. Monoranjan, are you in touch with uh, Arifun Nahar at SRDI? Uh, no, Katrin, I'm not um, connected with her. Oh, okay. So then I think this is a very nice opportunity to link you up. Um, Monoranjan is uh, one of the key people in Asia Mega Deltas, uh, the, the the case study for Bangladesh. Uh, of course, I know there are many more people, so uh, apologies to all the others. But I think it's nice to use the opportunity to link. Uh, and Arifun Nahar is from SRDI. So um, uh, in, in, uh, if you want to be linked up, please put your uh, uh, email address in the chat and then you can kind of communicate with each other. Uh, also, thanking, uh, thank you, uh, Arifun Nahar, to point out about the, the, the data uh, issue. That's what I understood. Uh, and the uh, emphasis you, you uh, said to for a harmonized methodology. Um, and good to know also about your international experiences 
uh, and farm level experiences. Um, uh, I, I'm moving back to Pim. Uh, yeah. Pim, um, yeah. with regard to uh, to data sharing, uh, what do, did you come across? Uh, because I think data sharing for all of the people in Asia Mega Deltas and also in Wageningen, we, we, we regularly have difficulty uh, because either the data is not available, but or people do not want to share it. Um, how did you tackle those matters? Uh, I think we have uh, variables that are not very sensitive in nature. So all the all the data that we do research on is publicly available on their project websites. And that's also why it's quite important that one of the criteria is that they have an open, public accessible website. So uh, all the variables that you see, uh, most of them, uh, they have not been retrieved through interviews or like uh, secret documents. It's all public available. So there is not a lot of sensitivity uh, in the data that we have, the data that we share. Um, and that makes a lot of uh, potential problems, uh, yeah, relatively easy to bypass. And one of the uh, the variables that we look at, so the MRV mechanisms, that has to do a lot with transparency and accountability. And if there is no publicly available data, then it's not there. So that is it is a data point by itself. And then we don't try to retrieve that data because then we have problems with sharing that again. Then we just say like there is not any publicly available data. So we really look at publicly available data and that yeah, kind of solves that bottleneck for me. Uh, on the uh, harmonized uh, uh, methodology, I'd like to just ask a, a brief clarification question because um, I, I thought she was also talking a bit about like soil me measurements. So do you point towards like our qualitative method, uh, Arif Funaha, or do you talk a bit more broadly about soil mapping and uh, and crop mapping and that kind of stuff? Sorry, Pim, I, I couldn't hear your question. Uh, so the question that you asked previously about the harmonized method, uh, were you aiming towards like the method that we conducted for a map, so the qualitative method of mapping initiatives, or were you talking a bit more broadly about the soil mapping, uh, soil research, crop mapping, and that kind of stuff? Uh Thank you. Uh, in study Soil Research Development Institute, we usually uh, take data from field uh, during the dry season. Uh, uh, we uh, surveyed the coastal area and uh, we collect data. Uh, we extract the data in laboratory. Uh, we, we are a part of a global learn, uh, though we are part of learn, but uh, we have some problem. Uh, now it is that maybe institutional or maybe our policy. Uh, we are trying, but, but yeah. uh, there is maybe some problem. I uh, understand. Kate, our last you... salinity so... map was uh, formed in 2009. After that, we couldn't uh, uh, make any salinity mapping uh, due to data collection, procedure, extraction, and many others. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, Kate, can you maybe talk about what INSAS is doing on, on basically making a harmonized method for these uh, these issues at hand? Yeah, so in principle, um, there I think basically in September, in September, October, there will be a new report published um, about salinity mapping and assessment in the soils and harmonization of those, and also which methods are most commonly used. Uh, indeed, uh, there is currently a lack of harmonization of soil mapping and soil assessment um, and for many reasons. So uh, a bit of harmonization would be definitely uh, good. Sometimes, however, it also makes sense to use different methods because of different natural conditions. So not always the same method for, for mapping can be used everywhere. Um, but I think that we are also talking about two types of mapping because um, salinity mapping, well, soil salinity or water salinity mapping uh, can indeed produce uh, very good and very helpful maps. Um, but mapping the initiatives shows us um, something a little bit different. So where people are actually interested in salinity um, 
a little bit detached from whether the salinity actually is there or not. So based on your question, I think it would be very interesting to see um, whether we can overlay both maps and see whether the salinity presence and the initiative presence or the interest uh, in salinity matches. So which areas are currently maybe underdeveloped uh, as it comes to the initiatives where we need to put a little bit more emphasis uh, and which are really well researched and uh, represented. Yeah, what do you think about this? Okay, I think everybody is very politely listening, <laughs> but uh, and not giving a reaction to the question. I think it, it's very nice that there is a document coming on harmonizing and <clears throat> I'm sure people will be interested to learn more about it. So if you could share a link, uh, I'm sure people would like to read about that. Um, uh, I'm seeing that uh, uh, Pim already put a link to the knowledge portal in the in the chat. Um, Pim, do you want to say something further about the knowledge portal? Yeah, uh, I just wanted to say if anyone's interested in, in actual salinity mapping, so not initiatives, but actually like looking at the soil and salinity, uh, FAO has also published a lot of uh, materials on that, and they are also gathered uh, in the knowledge portal. So there's this little header on, on mapping, uh, and there is a lot of content that you can read about in, in how the FAO maps salinity and uh, they are working on a global salinity map. Uh, Kate, do you know when 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 the the map is finally going to get expanded to include the whole world? I don't have up to date information about that, but um, hopefully within a year or two. Okay, yeah. And right now it uh, it, it has mapped. Uh, let me see. Um, well, it's Europe, right? For sure. Yeah, so oh no, now it's mapped uh, North America, South America, all of Africa except North Africa, uh, Russia, India, most of Southeast Asia. So it's basically missing China, the Arabian Peninsula, Western Europe, Australia, North Africa. So that, that will be included in like two years. But for now, it's uh, it has included the rest. Okay, um, well, uh, it's uh, good to know that uh, all this is available on the knowledge portal. Um, yeah. In the kind of uh, to to wind up uh, the session, uh, and just to take time also to link to a next session uh, in about a month's time. First of all, I want to thank you, Pim and Kate, uh, for um, uh, explaining us in detail about uh, the the salad initiative, about uh, the 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 mapping, about what is available and how it is collected and. Uh, how useful it can be and that we can all have access to it. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, all the audience also, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, this was our number 13 of the Delta Talks. Number 14 is due next month. And um, if I'm not mistaken, the, to the topic is harnessing local scale hydrological insights for enhanced water and salinity management in Asia Mega Deltas. So we stick with the water and salinity uh, topic, but we move in particular to the local scale hydrological insights. Uh, I'm not exactly sure, uh, me and who will be the speaker uh, for that session? Um, I don't have the info yet at the moment, but we will definitely um, yeah, inform everyone. And you have soon. a date already? Probably it is last week of the month. Probably last week of um, September. Yeah, so probably somewhere around 25 September. Uh, we will shortly be back sending an invite. Uh, once more, thank you all very much. Uh, and exactly on the dot of 11.30 on my side, I can wish you a nice day and looking forward to talk to you soon. Bye for now. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye.